Big stories. First, the people versus Simpson. The witness who still has the world talking, taking the stand for the trial. Brian, Cato Kalen, B-R-I-A-N. And the defense ending its cross-examination, accusing one of the LAPD's top dogs of perjury. And did you also indicate under penalty of perjury, sir, that you observed what appeared to be human blood, which was later confirmed by a criminalist to be human blood? Yes, I said that. On the East Coast, a shooting rampage at a sleepy New Jersey post office. Tonight, two big stories on two separate coasts. Live from South Florida's news station, WSBN 7. This is 7 News at 10 o'clock. And good evening again. He is back and he is ready for the real thing. We're talking about Brian Cato Kalin taking the stand, telling jurors how he came to meet Nicole and O.J. Simpson. Cato is starting his testimony late this afternoon, squirming and fidgeting in the witness chair a bit. That after the defense ended its cross-examination of Detective Philip Van Atter with a bang. Johnny Cochran, meanwhile, getting ready for his next court battle, only this time he is the defendant. The night team's John Turchin is the only South Florida reporter covering this trial from Los Angeles. He joins us now live. John? Well, Kelly, America's most famous house guest, uh, Cato Kalin, certainly making this an interesting day, definitely providing a change of pace around here, especially when you consider the fact that we've been listening to testimony from detectives for several days, and he wasn't on the stand more than a couple of minutes before the guy now known for his looks and the laughs, well, brought the house down. Brian, Cato Kalen, BR. Another moment in the spotlight. A -A -A Classic Cato. You a little bit nervous today? Feel great. <laughs> a little nervous. From all appearances, the aspiring actor hasn't changed much. Yes, his shaggy blonde hair is longer, but his sense of humor is still sharp and never more evident than when questioned about why he moved into O.J. Simpson's estate. Did you think that your friendship with him, your acquaintanceship, especially living on his property, might send acting roles your way? I didn't think that. If, if he did, if he'd, he'd bring up on his own. I don't think we're going for the same parts. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't. <laughs> Kalen told jurors he met Nicole Brown Simpson in December 1992 in Aspen, Colorado. He said they became friends, and he moved into her guest house a month later. When Nicole was planning on moving to the condo on Bundy, he moved in with O.J. at his insistence. Until June, he lived there rent-free. Did he indicate to you in some way that he thought it was inappropriate for you to be in the same house with her? Or he didn't like it? Well, it not didn't like, but it probably wouldn't be right. And why wouldn't it be right? I, I don't know the answer. Were you lovers? No. His friends? Friends. And that, in fact, is what happened, isn't it? Kalen's appearance follows four days of testimony by Detective Phil Van Adder. Team Simpson seemed to score a few late points. Attorney Robert Shapiro got Van Adder to admit he made two mistakes on the search warrant affidavit, including saying there was human blood on the console of the Bronco when he didn't know for sure. I, I just... That was a, uh, a quick attempt to get a search warrant to... Uh, Move the investigation along. I didn't, uh, I missed some things in it that should have been in it. The bathroom? Air conditioner? Back to Cato. Uh, Prosecutor Marsha Clark just laying the groundwork, setting up that much anticipated testimony about the noise he says he heard outside his bedroom the night of the murders. Can you describe for us the noise you heard, Mr. Kalin? It was, um, you know, in my room, it has this, uh, wall in it, so, like that. Now remember, it was Cato who told Detective Mark Furman about those noises, which Furman says led him to that now infamous bloody glove. Reporting live in Los Angeles, John Turchin, 7 News Night Team. And from John Turchin in Los Angeles, we go to Olga Villaverde now in the National Satellite News Center with more on the man many are calling a celebrity, Olga. Craig, the anonymous house guest, now famous, turned actor slash singer, Cato Kalin, a man who's gone from an income of zero 
to an income of multiple zeros. Cato Kalin, America's favorite freeloader, 36 years old, born and raised in Milwaukee, now single but divorced and a father of a 10-year-old girl. His friends speak of him fondly. A real fun-loving guy. A guy who wanted to go to California and make it big. He did, in a California courtroom in the trial of the century. There's nothing he really asked me to do, you know, feed the dogs, really about it. America's most famous house guest who has become an instant celebrity, mostly in part because the night Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman were murdered, Cato says he heard a thump. You know, in my room, it has this uh, wall in it, uh, like that. From that thump has come memorable moments for the aspiring actor. Hi, I'm Cato Kalin. Seen here cracking jokes on Talk Soup. They said I'd only have 15 minutes of fame, but thanks for Talk Soup, I've got a whole half hour. And more of the spotlight, Cato Kalin seen here playing a role in Trapped in Paradise and here in Beach Fever. Would you like to go out tonight? You would! You would like to go out, that's, that's great. Cato also appeared in several B-movies and even a porn film. And of course, the unemployed house guest now on almost every single cover of supermarket tabloids. His attorney says he's sick of the sleaze. This is a kid who is a serious, hard-working actor. He's clean-cut. He goes to church every Sunday. And finally, loved by Simpson's children who named their dog after their favorite person, Cato Kalin. And Cato Kalin has hired veteran Hollywood publicist Lee Solters. Now, no one will say how much it's costing Cato, but Solters said he imposed conditions on the deal. He said, quote, I told him I was interested in only one thing, career publicity, and not using O.J. Simpson as a device. At the National Satellite News Center, I'm Olga Villaverde, 7 News 19. All right, Olga, and for an insider's view of today's trial talk, we went straight to 7's legal expert, Howard Finkelstein, to break down the day's events. Mr. Shapiro did an excellent job in cross-examining Detective Van Adder about the demeanor of O.J. Simpson being cooperative. O.J. Simpson cooperated and came back voluntarily from Chicago when he didn't have to. The Cato we saw today was a slightly different Cato than we saw from the preliminary hearing. He was nervous, he was twitchy, and he was talkative. O.J. Simpson's defense attorney, Johnny Cochran, may be defending himself in his next court battle. A woman who claims she was Cochran's mistress holding a press conference today to announce legal action against Cochran. Patricia Ann Cochran says she and Johnny Cochran had a son during their 30-year relationship. She even took Cochran's last name. Well, now she's claiming payments that she has received over the past 10 years from Cochran under a verbal agreement that they have suddenly stopped. And I don't know why, why he would turn against me, why he cut me off, why he would want to see me hurt. Cochran's lawsuit seeks $1 million in damages. However, her attorney says she would settle for restoration of her $4,000 a month support payment, a car, and other expenses. Repeated attacks by the defense team leading to a rally tonight in support of police. All this comes after the city council in Los Angeles voted 10 to nothing on a resolution asking the lawyers to cease their criticism of the LAPD. Much of the anger was aimed at attorney Alan Dershowitz, who has been quoted as saying police officers are trained to lie on the witness stand. L.A. Police Chief Willie Williams says it is an outrage. Mr. Dershowitz owes an apology to the Los Angeles Police Department and he owes an apology to American police officers. Yes, that's correct. And he After hearing about this rally, Dershowitz said he stands by his beliefs about police officers so-called testa lying. In tonight's Simpson Watch, a judge mingling with the media and an O.J. fan packing up and heading out to Los Angeles. The judge requesting a copy of the recent PBS the special, Bull, Bull, John Tesh, live at Red Rocks with the Colorado Jazz Symphony like Orchestra. Ito saying he wanted the jurors to be able to watch the special. Tesh said he had no problem and even threw in autographed copies of the CD. And she's definitely not tired of all the OJ fuss. In fact, this fan is so crazy about the trial. Her husband has flown her out to L.A. to see it all in person. It seems that woman is not alone. The O.J. craze apparently keeping some workers from taking care of business, which is causing a number of companies to lose business and money. That story is coming up on 7 at 11. And 
Testimony resuming again tomorrow. Once again, Cato Kalin expected to return to that witness stand. Our live Team 7 coverage begins at noon. Another big story we are following for you tonight takes us to New Jersey. A gunman making a deadly delivery at a small post office. Covering this one for us, the night team's Penny Crone. She is live in Montclair, New Jersey with the details now. Penny. Craig, right now we don't know exactly what the story is. We don't know whether it was a, uh, a robbery. We don't know whether it was a hostage situation. Police are being very vague. We're going to show you the scene right now. It's hours after it happened. It happened about 5 o'clock this afternoon. You can see the FBI and the police are still investigating. Four people are dead. That's right. Four people were shot to death inside of this tiny post office in this tiny town. It was just very chaotic. I mean, you just, it was, it was just a lot of, I mean, people were just running and screaming and people just looked terrified. The sleepy town of Montclair was abruptly awakened today with the sounds of gunfire and death. The tragedy happened just moments before five. Police say they received a call. There was a robbery in progress. We have four males that are DOA at the scene. We have one male that's been medevac uh, to the University Hospital in Newark. Uh, that person is in critical condition at this time. When police arrived, they say they found four men shot to death. All of the bodies were in or near this tiny one-room post office. They say they have no suspects and add they never found a weapon. Police even admit that as of yet, they have found no witnesses. And now these horrifying murders have this tiny community scared to death. Many residents know some of the postal workers. And they would always tell me what stamps came in because they knew I liked stamps. And they would tell me what the latest one was. It was in, they were very nice gentlemen. They're always very sweet, very nice men, you know, always very helpful. Montclair is a very small, quiet community. Many of the residents are very frightened. In order to quell their fears, police are going door to door to talk with residents and assure them the neighborhood is well policed. Now the word out on the street here right now is that most of the residents say while they're staying inside they feel safe because they believe police would be much, much more serious about this case if in fact they thought the suspect was around here. In other words, people are walking down the street, they're at stores. Uh, they're going about their business, but as I said just now, they are going inside of their homes and they are trying to stay inside and keeping the doors locked. This investigation should be going on through the wee hours of the morning. The bodies of the victims have not yet been removed. Reporting from Montclair, New Jersey, I'm Penny Crone. Now back to you. All right, Penny, thank you very much. A double tragedy leading family and friends to the same street. A man apparently unable to cope with his friend's death tries to end his own life. The night team's Belkis DeRay working this one for us tonight from Coral Springs. Belkis. Kelly, I'm standing on Coral Springs Drive in Coral Springs. You can see this, unfortunately, is becoming somewhat of a, a memorial. When uh, Jesse Anders, or, excuse me, Armstrong died here last month, his friends came out here and left all kinds of loving messages for him here where he died. Well, tonight, it's Randy Pleason's friends who are hoping that they won't have to go through this again. <laughs> Randy Pleason's friends make their way to the scene where it happens in disbelief. I just, I just can't believe it, it ended like this. I mean, everyone knew Randy. He was a good kid. I, I really think there's a curse on Coral Springs because all this stuff is happening and nobody really understands why. Cursed because 20-year-old Pleason tried to take his own life in the same place where his friend Jesse Armstrong died just one month before. According to neighbors, Pleason had been sitting under this tree threatening to commit suicide, so police were called in and they blocked off the street. They tried to talk him out of it for more than an hour, but despite their efforts, he decided to cross the street over here to the median where he ended up shooting himself in the head. They were talking through the intercom that they have in their, in their cars, and they were just saying, oh, we'll work with you and... We've never let you down before. Just put the gun down. We'll talk it over. This past February, 18-year-old Jesse Armstrong was killed when one of his friends lost control of the car they were in, and it slammed into a tree. Friends say police and has been distraught over Armstrong's death since it happened, and police believe that may have been the motive behind the suicide attempt. He was just all depressed and everything over this, and 
he had some other problems, I guess. Randy's final farewell to his friend Jesse reads, Jesse, I love you with all my heart. Rest in peace, Randy. It's just one of many messages that covers part of Coral Springs Drive in Armstrong's memory. I just can't believe something like this happened, you know. Just the other, like two weekends ago, we were with him at the edge and hanging out and everything, and just now he's, you know, in the hospital. Now tonight, Pleason is listed in critical condition at North Broward Medical Center. Some of his friends here tonight on the street, as they have been coming all night long, kind of coming over, supporting each other, uh, praying, reflecting, hoping that Randy will pull through so that he can get the help that they say he needs. Live in Coral Springs, I'm Belkis Naray, 7 News 19. Okay, Belkis.